acoustics split into harmonies then, rocking and bouncing madly from the violins to viola to cello and back, while Weissmann thought, The fugue, meine liebe Gott, die große fugue, die Engels, die verdammte Engels. The wind added a fifth voice to the quartet, ethereal, pure, and taunting, higher than Saperstein could ever have played, Saperstein with his hollow eyes and bald yellow head, scraping weakly at his violin with the split back. The violin Sturmbannfuhrer Hostler had batted from his hands after Saperstein had mangled a run in the Schumann. Now the brief overtura was ended, and as the music grew more frenzied, he saw Saperstein in the gem-clear theatre of memory the control room had become, Saperstein's bald head bouncing like a great shapeless ball, trying to hold the angles together in the chaotic labyrinth of the double fugue section. And there was Brendel sawing away on second, the poorest player of the four, a constant frown of fear on her cracked gray lips. Dessauer on viola, consumptive, withered, brilliant, fingers clawed with cold and arthritis, so that the simplest run became agony and an extended trill a horror. Oh, how they played, even with their infirmities and terrors, with the acrid wind in counterpoint and the moans of the dying as a constant continuo, playing because not to play was to die. And as the others passed by, the ones who would leave as smoke, whose dying music would turn to muffled cries of anguish as the gas stole all they had left, it was their eyes that burned, their sneers that accused, not the cruel eyes of the masters, the storm und drang headed fools who kept the angles alive for their music, for the serenade sung to their master, death. The rollicking double fugue, clattering along like dead men's bones, slowed and shifted to the G-flat section, startlingly lyrical after the previous madness, and the slow, somber chords took Weissmann back fully, adding to sight and sound and scent the sense of touch as well, so that he held the long horsehair bow in his right hand, while his left palm pressed the sweat-polished smoothness of his cello's neck, and his fingers trembled on the fingerboard. Oh, the faces were there, so real, so vivid, so full of pain and battered hope and envy as they looked at the angles, and the thoughts were so loud he could hear them saying, If I could play, I would not be walking to death. I had my body to keep me alive, but it failed me at last. When your hands fail you, you will join us. Play your tunes, whores, for the Nazis. You will play another soon enough. They were the voices Karl Weissmann had heard for over four decades, the voices that yammered at him in dreams, that spoke just below the surface of melody that lay in wait everywhere he turned, that made it impossible for him to have a radio, a television set, to go to movies or stores where always the music played, the remindful, omnipresent music that inflated the guilt within him like the bloated stomach of a corpse, until there was only one one statement, one great truth. You should have died. It was what all the faces had told him as they passed every day, every single face, even Anna. Allegro molto. Now they were into it again, the notes galloping like war maddened furies, weaving in and out of each other as Saperstein's head bobbed frantically, the fear of losing the beat clear in his eyes as the tempo increased. And now they were nearing the measure he had never forgotten, would never forget, when Anna. There. His heart stopped. The shock was so great. Stopped, then started again in a frenzy as if to make up for its failure. The error, the false note he had played when he had seen her, the B-flat that had shrieked and twisted into a gratingly off-key natural before he could find his place in the fugue again. He had heard it on the tape, and its presence told him precisely what day it was, what day it had been ever since. March 17th, 1944, the day when Anna, his Anna, 
Anna of the long, tapered fingers that had caressed a piano's keys like a baby's brows, had walked into the yard with the others, had turned to the left at the flick of the commandant's whip. Anna, whose fingers had been crushed by the cattle car's doors, whose music had been crushed by a young and careless army guard, too anxious to shut away the Jews from his sight. Anna, who at last turned toward the path of death, of escape on the cruel wind. His fingers had slipped then, the one time, the only time he had drawn disharmony into the air of Adlercrawler. But he had re-entered the tapestry of the fugue, playing as though sound alone could halt time and reverse it, savaging the strings with the intensity of his grief. No, he had thought, no, it is a mistake. Every time, every time she returns alive, they have made a mistake. They will see she is still strong. They will see. And now the fifth and final sub-movement began, a trembling rapid pulse as he sawed and sawed, biting the notes off, back and forth, back and forth, while the melody soared leisurely above him, as if two differing tempi warred above sublimely for predominance, he and Dessauer's unbridled ferocity against Brendel and Saperstein's patient and unhurried calm. The end approached, and he saw an S.S. Obersturmfuhrer cross to the women and look at Anna, and he thought, Now, now they will see, even though he knew that what had happened had happened and could never be changed. Nothing could ever be changed. As the Obersturmfuhrer regarded the women coldly and turned from them, young Karl Weissmann's last hope vanished like a pianissimo phrase on the wind, and all thoughts of music fled from him. His left hand slipped down the neck of the cello, and his right lowered the bow to his side, while Saperstein's old eyes flared and blinked a panicked signal. But Weissman's full attention was on the young, fatally slim woman who walked past the quartet's platform with the others, others who looked at the musicians with a loathing that would survive them by a lifetime. And in the young Carl's eyes... The young woman stared at him with envy mixed with anguish, while her mouth opened pleadingly and formed words he took to be the muttered curses the others had voiced, and, perhaps worse, a call for help that he could not give. But years later, in the old man's mind that looked in memory through the young man's eyes, Karl Weissmann saw something else. To his surprise, and to the accompaniment of a startling joy that he told himself he must not feel even as it overwhelmed him, he saw not hate but love in the eyes, and hope. And he knew at last what she was saying, knew, not guessed or wished, for he heard her now, above the whining, suddenly impotent wind, and the other three trying to sound like four. Play, she said, play for me. And while the young man in 1944 sat ignorant and powerless, deafened by guilt and grief and distance, Karl Weissmann, hearing, grabbed an unseen cello and an invisible bow, and in a cracked voice that filled the darkened control room, sang for Anna sang to its glorious end the great fugue he had begun so many years before. As the notes poured out of him, so too did something else, something that eyes younger than Karl Weissmann's might have detected as a veil of shadow, a sheet of darkness that unfolded from around Weissmann like a cloak of the thinnest gossamer, to hover just below the ceiling, into which it seemed to fade as the music ended. 4. The halls were empty at five in the morning when an impatient Bobby Goodman arrived at the Republic Records building. The night janitors had finished their shifts hours ago, and it would be another three hours before anyone else showed up. Goodman wondered where Carl Weissman was. He paused before opening the control room door, not knowing what his usually glib tongue would say if the old man were still there. But the room was vacant, at least of Carl Weissman. 
From the instant he entered, Goodman felt oddly unalone, as if someone were watching from the shadows in the room's corners. He threw off the unexpected sensation long enough to look at the tiak and grinned at what he saw. The take-up reel was full. He listened, Goodman said, laughter in his voice. He heard it. He shot his gaze to the Nakamichi's counter, which stood at one twenty-seven. It had been at triple zero when he'd left Weissman alone in the room. Oh, God damn! God damn! he cried gleefully, rewinding the cassette on which Carl Weissman had offered up his reactions. Okay, baby, he said, pushing the play button. Let's hear it. It seemed as though the voice belonged to a much younger man, as if years had been lifted from it and tossed away. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. I don't know what you want to hear me say. I don't know why you wanted me to hear the music. But I thank you for driving me to the point where I listened. The voice paused, then went on. I did not believe before, in anything, but now I do. I believe in God again. For how else can I explain how this has come back to me across all the miles and the years? Yet it has somehow, to give me peace, to give me back my music. Thank you for the part you played in this, whatever your reasons. I wish I could give you something in return. Another pause, so long that Goodman looked at the machine to make sure it was still running. Only one word followed. Perhaps and then silence. Goodman sat back, thinking, what the hell had Weissman meant? Goodman had expected almost anything but the cool, confident words that had come from the speakers. He rewound the tape and listened to Weissman again, but still could not unravel the mystery he had convinced himself must exist. Maybe the music would give him a clue, something he'd missed on previous listenings. He rewound the tape on the TIAC, started to play it, and listened as the cold wind swept into the room, chilling him through the heavy sweater he wore. As the first unison notes of music sounded, the lights of the room started to dim, and the darkness began to grow, creeping from the corners, melting from the ceiling until it encased him in a black gelatinous shell of fear. And in the back of his mind, he realized that some emotions do not die when their bearer deserts them that when the nurturing of pain is strong and lifelong, then the pain and the guilt and terror that feed it live on, not destroyed, but waiting. The music played on, rushing about his mind like waves on a blood-red sea, drowning him as he tried to float above the surface, pressing down upon him with gaunt, hate-filled faces, envious eyes, hands brittle and thin as sticks. The music cut and tore and burned and froze, every phrase more cruel than the last, until he knew he could bear no more. But he did, unable to move, unable to retreat into unconsciousness, until the last few measures were ended, the final measures in which the cello, deep and sonorous, sang in triumph over its stringed fellows. The fugue was ended. Goodman sat in the chair, sick and shaking, his sole desire to run from the room when his legs would finally obey him, to run and run until he was far away from where the agonies of the music seared him. He did not want to hear it ever again. He did not want to hear the music. I say every house in America should have an electric chair. And every man just once in his life should sit in it, just so that he can feel the power of millions of gallons of electricity flow through his veins. I got an electric chair, that's all I need. You get an electric chair, Sheldon, you don't have to worry about the audience. You get an electric chair, you can tell them anything you want, as long as it's real. You get yourself an electric chair, and I'll sit there all night long. Kind of a funny idea, sitting in an electric chair and doing a show. Well, think of the therapeutic value of an electric chair, and all the money it is. Yes, sir, an electric chair in a home. 
The Electric Chair. A show about horror. ElectricChairShow.com. Electric Chair. Wow.